The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to The David Pakman Show. We are live every Monday through Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern. Hi to everyone watching on YouTube, including everybody from the We Survive Bush, You'll Survive Obama Facebook page, of course, as well as the I Love It When I Wake Up in the Morning and Barack Obama is President Facebook page. Lewis now religiously trolling both of those Facebook pages on a daily basis. Sure. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Let's there see if go. anyone can figure out who, who I am on there. Hey, remember this video from Todd Aiken, which of course now, how could, how could any of us forget? It is now etched into, into my mind, at least. Let me just uh, uh, jog your memory. It seems to me, first of all, from what I understand from doctors, that's really rare. If it's a legitimate rape, <laughs> uh, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. But right. Let's so everybody remembers that. We now have a new contender in the stupid comments about rape based on religion category, which is a pretty extensive category, which you, you wouldn't really think you would need that as a category. But in American right. politics, you actually do because of re the Republican it's Party. Very sad, but yes. Now we have at the final debate in the Indiana Senate race, which was held just last night, Republican nominee Richard Murdoch explained his uh, opposition to abortion, even in cases of rape and incest. And he indicated that there should be no exceptions because of rape, because rape pregnancies are themselves the will of God. Here is the video that has been making headlines around the world in the last 12 hours. And I warn you, it is quite shocking for people who believe in thinking and common sense. Common and, sense. Yeah. yeah. So if you if you're if you're shocked by that, uh, uh, by a lack of, of, of thinking and common sense, then you will be shocked by this. Take a listen. You know, this is that issue that every candidate for federal or even state office faces, and I too certainly stand for life. I know there are some who disagree, and I respect their point of view, but I believe that life begins at conception. Yeah. Uh, the only exception I have for, uh, to have an abortion is in that case of the life of the mother. I, I just, I struggled with it myself for a long time, but I came to realize life is that gift from God, and I think even when life begins in that horrible situation of rape, that it is uh, something that God intended to happen. Right. God intended for rape pregnancies to happen. Uh, now, of course, also released within hours of this just before Mitt Romney endorsing this guy. <laughs> Gotta love it. This fall, I'm supporting Richard Murdoch for Senate. Yeah. As state treasurer, right. Richard worked with Governor Daniels to balance the budget and make government more accountable. Yeah. As senator, Richard will be the 51st vote to repeal and replace government-run health care. Richard will help stop the liberal Reed oh Pelosi agenda. There's so much at stake. There I hope so there is the Mitt Romney endorsement of this individual. Now, God is quite a guy, right? I mean, God intended for rape pregnancies to happen. How many details of the rape does God plan? Like, is he, how, how involved is he in rape pregnancies, Lewis? I, I can't really say. I've never, I've never done any research on the topic. Well, so then pretty much everything is the will of God, right? I mean, why bother with health care? Why bother with police? Why bother with nati national defense, education, helping the poor? It's all the will of God. God's got it. It's all, it's all planned, Lewis. It's pretty easy. Except it's, it's for very defense. Convenient. Except for defense. Of course, on defense spending, it's not up to God. It's up to the U.S. spending a ton of money and having 50 bases in I'm, Germany. I'm right. confused about why he would make an exception in the case of the life of the mother. Isn't that God's plan as well, to kill the mother? Yeah, wouldn't the mother dying also be part of God's plan? I guess God's plans are only related to... Uh, to life and not death, maybe. So the obvious know. question was, isn't Mitt Romney going to pull his endorsement? No. The Romney campus said the ad can stay. Governor Romney disagrees with Richard Murdoch's comments, and they do not reflect his views, said Andrea Saul, campaign spokesperson for Mitt Romney. But the endorsement stays, probably based on fiscal issues, right? Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. What's funny is this isn't really that outside the mainstream view of the Republican Party. I mean, we have a lot of Republicans who say stuff like this. All over, yeah. And who knows about the, uh, the ones in small towns, uh, towns all over the country. We're not hearing mayors, uh, you know, selectmen, uh, all sorts of board members. For sure. Governors. I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of governors we're unaware of. Uh, Murdoch came out today and did an apology. It was the most bogus apology I've ever heard, basically saying, you know, he, he basically did the same thing all of these right wingers do when they say something offensive. They come out and say, what I said was interpreted as the opposite of what I meant. It's always a big misunderstanding. He there, didn't mean no, any of it. There's no misinterpreting that. There's also no misinterpreting Ann Coulter calling President Obama a retard. You know, I thought that we kind of grew out of using that term. 
because of course it is very, very offensive to people who have uh, mental uh, disabilities and, and uh, learning disabilities and challenges of that kind. But Ann Coulter, let's put up the tweet, tweeted out that President Obama is a retard just several hours ago. Natan, can we put that tweet up to look at? We're calling for the tweet. There it is. I highly approve of Romney's decision to be kind and gentle to the retard, referring, of course, to the Monday night presidential debate. So she is actually um, completely out of her mind is really what's going on here. But some people say that she's trying to sell books and that this is going to sell her books. Now, I don't know why anybody would buy the book of someone who says that the president is a retard. I don't know how that helps sell books, but that's the conventional wisdom. She's selling books. There are a lot of people who love Ann Coulter and think she is brilliant. There are a lot of people who look at her stuff just for shock value. And I believe that everything she does is for shock value. That's why we're talking about her now, because her comment has shock value. Well, what's incredible is that if Ann Coulter were right in indicating that the president is uh, mentally handicapped, it's incredible that a mentally handicapped man is neck and neck with Mitt Romney, who's like a smart business guy, supposedly. And won the last election. And won the last election. It's amazing, Lewis, isn't it? You know what? Uh, I'm glad that uh, that people who are disabled are doing that well. There's actually a uh, there's an open letter to Ann Coulter that was written on specialolympicsblog.wordpress.com, which is a uh, it's actually a blog written by an individual who, uh, who, who is mentally handicapped. He has Down syndrome. He's a 30-year-old man, and he actually wrote a great letter. His name is, I believe it's John Franklin Stevens. And he said, come on, Ms. Coulter, you aren't dumb and you aren't shallow, so why are you continually using a word like the R word as an insult? I'm a 30-year-old man with Down syndrome who has struggled with the public's perception that an intellectual disability means I am dumb and shallow. I'm neither of those things, but I do process information more slowly than the rest of you. In fact, it's taken me all day to figure out how to respond to your use of the R word last night. Very, very offensive. And uh, I, there's just nothing. It's, it's not even the type of shock value that lends itself to any kind of real discussion, right? I mean, it's not shock value in terms of a, a, a very shocking accusation about the president, which then we go and we say, well, is it true? Is it not true? It's just being offensive for the sake of being offensive. And it's that's disgusting. It. That's it. That's that's what she does. That's all it is. Yeah. Donald Trump and Gloria Allred, both in the last 24 hours, seem to be planning some October surprises. They both have kind of fell completely flat on their face. First to Donald Trump. Donald Trump started tweeting and saying he had unearthed potentially some divorce papers of Michelle Obama and the, and the president. And there were a number of questions about what is he actually going to release? What's going on? Well, we finally heard what the big Trump October surprise supposedly is. He is asking the president to release his college and passport applications, saying if the president does that, Trump will donate $5 million to the charity of President Obama's choice. Wow. Well, I'm shocked, Lewis. What a surprise. Hmm. Okay. And then the Gloria Allred one was that Gloria Allred, according to a number of different sources, including Radar Online and TMZ, Gloria Allred's planned October surprise is that Mitt Romney allegedly lied under oath about the value of Staples, a business with which he was involved, to prevent the founder of Staples, Mr. Stenberg's wife, from walking away with more money in her divorce settlement. Do you follow that, Lewis? Should, should I explain it in another Seems way? a little far-fetched. I don't know if it's far-fetched. I just don't know if, if these are, number one, is it really an October surprise if they're saying what they're working on? And why would you wait? Why would you wait? Well, because that's the idea, for it to be an October surprise. Uh, uh, this is just all ridiculous. Natan, what do you think about this? Can you actually, if you say in advance what the surprise is, is it still a surprise? No, I think the people that say that they are creating an October surprise don't understand what October surprise means. It right. means something that no one can predict that is a, a world event, usually, or a, a significant national event. It's not uh, releasing some sort of a piece of data. <laughs> that, that's, they just don't understand what it means. It's a, it's a semantic uh, uh, misunderstanding, Lewis. And the information they're holding on to is, is basically useless, and it would probably have no effect if it were uh, even now uh, out to the, the public. Well, if I had to say which of these were, were a bigger deal, I would say that it's, it's uh, Mitt Romney lying under oath about the value of one of his businesses to help someone not pay a woman 
their fair share in a divorce settlement. Yet more trouble with women with Mitt Romney. If it's true, these are both alleged that will now, I mean, the, the Trump one, we know what it is now. He, he's offering $5 million if Obama shows us his passport application. Again, connected to birtherism in some way. I can't believe this stuff is still happening. Here's something interesting. We've been covering, along with Brad Friedman at the Brad blog and a, and a few other independent media outlets, the connection between Bain Capital and Tag Romney with some of the heart intercivic voting machines. You remember this story, Lewis. We've been of talking course. about it for a while. Yeah. Think Progress, which is actually a great website. We use Think Progress as a source for a number of different stories on the show. We consider them really to be kind of on our side. Think Progress put out a blog post. I don't know if I want to call it a smear, but it's definitely very critical of the Brad blog, and it actually embeds our video in the article where we talk about the concerns that the Bain, the Bain and Tag Romney involvement in the voting machines is there. And they're calling it a conspiracy theory. Think Progress is going on and on saying that basically there is no reason for concern here. There is no evidence that Tag Romney is involved in changing ballots, et cetera, et cetera. And it actually says, uh, uh, there, there's actually a line here which says, dwelling on the possibility that a company tangentially related to the Romney family may tamper with their own product distracts from the very real and far more insidious ways that conservatives are trying to manipulate the election. For example, the voter registration firm, blah, 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 hot fabricating reports. I, I take issue with this. And Brad Friedman was on Tom Hartman's The Big Picture Show on RT last night. And he said the same thing, which is we're not specifically saying that Tag Romney has already done something. What we're saying is that the fact that of all the millions and millions and millions of people that are involved in politics and and, and ec private equity and manufacturing machines and all these different things. The fact that a candidate's former employer and son have connections to voting machines, that alone is a problem. We shouldn't even have that. We don't need to say Tag Romney was sitting there with a screwdriver messing with the voting machines. We don't need to get to that point. And I'm a little bit disturbed that Think Progress is trying to dismiss this as a conspiracy theory. Yeah, uh, the, the connection is there. It's all the evidence is out there and to not bring this up, to not even say that this should be looked into further or this should be brought to the attention of the American people and would the, be completely the, irresponsible. The counter example is imagine if, I don't know, Barack Obama's Pakistani roommate from when he lived in New York, I think, for a couple of years was connected to the voting machines in the same way. Do you think this wouldn't be all over corporate news, Natan? It would be. And just to underscore the point that both of you are making, you know, the the, um, the point here is to just point out that uh, the election system, the electoral process in terms of voting should be totally separated from special interests. It's, it's just, just a very incestuous. basic point. It's not about a conspiracy theory where we're pointing fingers and saying there is going to be fraud. It's not about fraud. It's about the possibility of fraud and about eliminating that. I'm very surprised that Think Progress has taken this line. Lewis hosts and produces the, the bonus show. Okay, now to get the bonus show, you have to become a David Pakman Show member. It takes seconds. It costs pennies a month. David pa pennies a day, rather. Excuse me, Lewis. Uh, DavidPakman.com slash membership. I'm going to actually tell a story on today's bonus show, which is kind of an embarrassing story. Uh, an incident that I had at a movie theater recently. And well, not, not really recently. It depends on what recently means, but yeah. uh, certainly in the modern era of the David Pakman Show. And, or maybe not. <laughs> but it's a story that is quite embarrassing that happened to me at a movie theater. Lewis was there. I'll talk about that on the bonus show and plenty of other stuff. So sign up at davidpackman.com slash membership. Stay tuned. Plenty more after the break. The David Pakman Show at davidpackman.com. Welcome back to the David Pakman Show. Let's say hi to a new David Pakman Show member made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Life's just not fair to conservatives, Lewis. Everywhere you look, it's liberal bias. Find the best examples at liberalbias.com. Today's new member of the day, James Williams. James Williams, along with every other David Pakman Show member, are single-handedly helping keep the show afloat 
expanding with new projects and many, many exciting new things on the horizon. Exactly. Yes. Thank you for your support. Very good. Hey, remember that line from the third presidential debate on Monday where Mitt Romney was talking about how the U.S. Navy has less ships now than in 1916 or something like that. And Barack Obama said, well, listen, we've got fewer horses and bayonets, too. Times have changed, basically making it clear that what does it matter if we have less ships? Everything is different now. It turns out that that line confused Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan just didn't understand the line, and apparently nobody explained it to him. Because here's what he had to say on CBS this morning. He, he just doesn't understand it. He looks visibly confused by it. Look at this. That was one of the sharpest exchanges in the debate. And President Obama said this is not a game of battleship. Um, that yes, there aren't as many ships, but there aren't as many horses and bayonets. That's a pretty tough attack. To compare modern American battleships <laughs> and Navy with bayonets, I just don't understand that comparison. <laughs> Look, we have to have a strong Navy to keep peace and prosperity and sea lanes open. Right. The president's, all these defense cuts, if all these defense cuts go through, right, our right, Navy... Right. He just doesn't get it. That's, that's the bottom line. And then he shifts into talking points. Is the, like, what's going on here? Is this for real? Does Paul Ryan really not understand that it's, it's, a, it's a likening, it's a comparison? What, what's wrong with Paul Ryan? I find it very hard to believe that Paul Ryan did not understand that. <laughs> Is this because the other thing I thought you it know was what, the other thing is that he may maybe just be he's trying, pretending not to understand it to show how silly it was or or he's tr trying to make it sound like that was actually the comparison that Barack Obama was trying to make to make Obama look bad. Yeah, I don't get And if he's if the idea is to make his lack of understanding be some kind of an attack on Obama, I don't think it's coming off effectively, Natan. Yeah, you know, um, that line that Ann Coulter uh used on Obama recently that we talked about in the previous segment. I'm starting to be a little concerned for Paul Ryan. Uh, I don't, maybe it's the stress of the campaign that's getting to him. Maybe that duress that he was accusing Joe Biden of having uh, is coming back to haunt him. Yeah. But uh, something's wrong with this guy. Something seems to be wrong here if, uh, because if he, th if he really didn't understand the line, that's concerning. And if he thinks that the way in which he's explaining how he didn't understand it is somehow a critique of Obama, He's also living on cloud nine because that doesn't make any sense either. Yeah, v very strange stuff. Unbelievable. If you've been on the internet the last 24, 48 hours, you may have noticed that the Mitt Romney campaign seems to, have be, uh, seems to be taking on an air of strong confidence. Drudge Report ran an Obama needs a miracle headline. Dick Morris, former friend of the Clintons and now a, a strong Republican advocate, was on the Bill O'Reilly show last night and he said, listen, we are going to see Mitt Romney win with over 300 electoral votes. It's going to be four to eight point, uh, a four to eight point margin in the popular vote. And he's going to win Michigan. He's going to win Pennsylvania. And he's going to win uh, Wisconsin, all states, which, which it appears really by looking at the polls right now, that Barack Obama is going to win. I think the idea here is that for the few undecided voters that are still out there, a factor in who they vote for might be wanting to be on the winning team. So if you're really kind of undecided, which means you really have no idea what these candidates are about. In other words, if you know so little about this election that you really don't, uh, don't know less than two weeks out who you're going to vote for, you might just say to yourself, I want to be on the winning team in the end. Therefore, if you start hearing all the confident talk from the Romney campaign, you might say, well, if it's going to be Romney in the end, I'd like to be on the winning team. I'm going to vote for Romney. What do you guys think? Why, why is the Romney campaign so outwardly confident right now? You have to be confident. It's, it's good to be confident. If you're not confident as a presidential candidate and in your debates and in your campaigning, you're setting yourself up for failure. But there's a the difference start. between the general confidence of the stump speeches, Natan, of saying, I will be the next president and the first thing I will do is this, to actually having this uh, very specific, we're going to win, we're going to have a ton of electoral votes, this is not going to be close, we're ahead, which we're seeing in the last few days. Yeah, very clearly this is a campaign tactic that Karl Rove endorsed in 2000 in the last days of the 2000 campaign against Gore. They were saying the same thing, that they're going to win by 320 electoral votes and this and that. And then Bush actually went to California to uh, act as if California were now in play because right. there's a wave of Republican enthusiasm. This is just a campaign ploy. The, the fact of the matter is that uh, the campaign is pretty steady and Obama has a slight lead and that's the state of the game. There could be a backfire, Lewis, to using this strategy because uh, it's really more of a tactic than a strategy. 
if, if, if we're really talking about a turnout election where voter enthusiasm and therefore turnout determines who wins rather than actually convincing people to switch candidate, if President Obama supporters were experiencing some reduced enthusiasm under the idea that President Obama was running away with this, hearing confidence from the Romney campaign could actually get out the vote for Obama supporters because they may hear, oh, wait a second, this is way closer than I thought. I'd better get out there and vote. Yeah, I, I guess it could go either way. I, I still think it is important for there to be confidence overall uh, with your campaign. But is this a bit too much? Maybe. There was a global poll of the U.S. presidential race, and President Obama has a massive lead, which I don't think is surprising at all. We had Dennis Campbell on a couple of weeks ago in our World View segment. He made it very clear that a poll in Europe was very favorable to President Obama. Let's put up some of these responses. Let's put up first the Obama responses, Natan. And if we look at the different countries around the world which were measured here, France is the most strongly pro-Obama country. at 72 percent, according to the BBC. Let's see if we can get that up, it's, Natan. It's locked up. I'm trying to get it on. Yeah, let's because uh, these are the first I want to look at the, the Obama numbers. And uh, I guess they didn't care too much that Mitt Romney was doing missionary work there. I guess not. Yeah. So here are the numbers. France is the one where President Obama is the strongest, followed by Australia, Kenya, Nigeria, Canada, Panama, UK, Brazil, Germany, Indonesia, South Korea, Spain, so on and so forth. Now, Republicans right away are seizing on the fact that Kenya is third on the list. Oh, well, the president's Kenyan, right? Not so fast. Let's put up the Mitt Romney list, Natan, please, if, if we may. And we will take a look at that. And as you can see there, Kenya is the country in which Mitt Romney has the strongest support as well. Of course, it doesn't even eclipse the 20% mark. I love that uh, Pakistan is, uh, seemed to be the only country that had more Mitt Romney support. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. The only country over in which Mitt Romney would win over Barack Obama is Pakistan which is fascinating, given that maybe they're upset about what President Obama did as far as Osama bin Laden goes. I don't know. But hey, at least Romney's carrying Pakistan. Yeah. Romney I, said he would do the same thing too, by the way, Pakistan. Of course, so you know. after the fact he did. Yeah. I just want to point out one thing. Uh, as everyone will notice, uh, the numbers don't add up to 100 because there's like a massive amount of undecided people in these polls. Right. Yeah. Good, good uh, point there, Natan. Let's talk about domestic polls and something that may be going on. Pollsters seem to be completely missing the Latino vote again. For the last, I don't know, 12, 14 years, we've been hearing about the underrepresentation of the Latino vote. Latino Decisions has put out an interesting paper which really outlines how when we look at some of these polls, for example, um, let's take a look at uh, the Monmouth University poll, which has Romney leading Obama 48 to 45. In that poll, President Obama is reported as leading by only six points among Latino voters, 48 to 42. Do you believe that it's really that low, Lewis? Very hard to believe. Very, Very hard, hard to believe. The last four polls released by Latino Decisions have found the Latino vote nationally to be 71-20 in favor of President Obama, 67-23 in favor of President Obama, 72-20 and 73-21. If you don't like those, if you say, well, it must be something about Latino decisions that's giving us these skewed numbers, well, the NB NBC Telemundo poll, they released two polls of Latino voters in October, 70 to 25, Obama, 70 to 20, just before that. So what we're seeing here is a significant discrepancy among how the Latino vote is being estimated in terms of its support for President Obama and for how many Latino voters will be voting. This could turn the election, couldn't it, Natan? Yep, it could turn the election. And you need to look no further than 2010 when, for example, in Nevada that has a high Latino population, Harry Reid was tied or slightly down against Sharon Engel, if you remember, uh, the Tea Party nut, and he won by five points. And so the Latino population is mostly concentrated in solidly red or blue states. But in Nevada, Colorado, uh, Arizona, Florida these states have high Latino populations and it could all, all of the polls in those states 
may be skewed one or two points uh, in Romney's favor right now. No question about it. Before to go to break, I do want to give a quick shout out to John, who is regularly on our YouTube live feed. He's been having um, he's been having a tough family situation going on, Lewis, and we won't go into detail and we won't give last names or anything like that. But needless to say, we're aware of it and we're very sorry uh, for 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 uh, what's been going on with John. And we're, of course, glad to have him on the live stream as always. And, and you know, we wish him the best for sure. Definitely. Let's take a break. Facebook.com slash David Pakman show. We will take a break. Greg Pallast is up next. You're not going to want to miss this Greg Pallast story. It turns out Romney has made millions from the auto bailout. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Greg Pallast is an investigative journalist and also the author of this book, Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, How to Steal an Election in Nine Easy Steps. Uh, Greg also has a great article, which is also uh, uh, referenced in the book. The, art, the name of the article in The Nation is uh, Mitt Romney's Bailout Bonanza, How He Made Millions from the Rescue of Detroit. Greg, we've heard from Mitt Romney for so long now that he actually didn't want Detroit to go bankrupt. At the same time, he wrote an op-ed years ago titled, Let Detroit Go Bankrupt. That, that in, uh, incredible uh, uh, inconsistency aside, it turns out he made a lot of money from what actually happened with the auto bailout. Talk about that. Yeah, and by the way, the Romney campaign confirmed to us that he did make the money. They won't say how much, but since our range was 100 up to $115 million, that I said that's the likely number. Personally, let's repeat that. Mitt Romney personally earned about $115 million million dollars from the auto bailout and uh the the key thing is not so much the hypocrisy hell if you don't know uh, if you haven't been watching american politics hypocrisy is you know is one of the key elements of american society so i'm not worried about hypocrisy i'm worried about what happened with uh the with the bailout in romney's case uh he bought up with his partners, uh, principally Paul the Vulture Singer is his limited partner, uh, and is also his major donor, the key donor, uh, one of his key economic advisors, and uh, and actually is a big part of his foreign policy operation because Dan Sinor, Mitt Romney's foreign policy chief, actually works for Paul the Vulture Singer. Now, when I say the Vulture, the Vulture is a name that's given to this guy by his happy bankers. He's a multi-billionaire who's made his bankers billions on various takedowns. Uh, it's called vulture operations and it's illegal in much of the world but not in the United States. And so what Mitt Romney and his vulture fund partners did was buy up the auto division, auto parts division of General Motors. It used to be called Delco. It's now called Delphi. They bought it out of bankruptcy for 67 cents a share. How they did that was an extraordinary flim-flam, but they got it. 67 cents a share. Then the Romney Group told the U.S. Treasury and GM, give us what we want. Give us our money. Or, And this is a quote. This is a quote told to the U.S. Treasury and GM. This is a quote. We will shut you down. They controlled, the Romney uh, group controlled all the steering columns, the steering wheels for all GM cars and Chrysler cars. <laughs> there, were, it, there was no way that GM could continue for a day without its, its auto parts, uh, especially its steering columns. Um, and it would cost, there was just no way to replace it. So GM would have been not just bankrupt, it, it would have been out of business, liquidated, gone. So they got their money. Altogether, it was $12.9 billion from the U.S. Treasury. $12.9 billion. So now the company, bloated with your money and mine, goes from $0.22, cents, uh, from $0.67 cents a share to $22 a share. And they begin selling it off. That's a 3,200% profit. 
then, and here's the ugly part, frankly. You know, uh, as Romney says, we celebrate success. What he means we celebrate making a lot of money. Okay, fine. God bless America. You know, only, you know, I, I appreciate a humble billionaire turning into a humble billion, a humble millionaire turning into a humble billionaire. Congratulations, Mr. Romney. But that's not the point. They closed every single General Motors parts plant that they controlled, but one, and sent every single UAW job to China. Every single unionized auto worker at GM parts operations, Delco, Delphi, every single one, 25,200 lost their jobs. But they did create jobs because 25,000 uh, production jobs were created in China. Right. So let me sum up at this point. We've got Mitt Romney here, who initially wrote an op-ed saying, let Detroit go bankrupt. Now, in retrospect, after President Obama's action in part was greatly responsible for saving General Motors, says he never said let Detroit go bankrupt. But simultaneously, what you've uncovered is that Mitt Romney was responsible not only for uh, uh, not, not only did he make money from this bailout, which actually took place, but in doing so, he actually did what he did at Bain Capital for so many years, which was reduce the number of jobs in the United States and send those jobs overseas. Yet another issue which President Obama did call him on in the debates, but for some reason is not resonating with the American people. The auto bailout represents exactly what we've been saying about Mitt Romney for the last several years. Well, this is much worse than anything he ever did at Bank Capital. Bank Capital is like Girl Scouts compared to <laughs> this vulture fund controlled by, by Singer the Vulture that he partnered up with. And uh, Singer the Vulture's activities, remember, are outlawed. This guy's an international outlaw in most of the world. And in fact, one of the reasons he's backing Mitt Romney clearly and providing him the services of Dan Sinor, his uh, policy his foreign policy advisor is that Mitt Ro is that excuse me President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton in April went into federal court to tell a judge to put the vulture out of business uh, on his activities because one of his big other big hit besides Delphi is an attack upon the nation of Argentina. He's demanding so much money from Argentina that Argentina will implode. Argentina was once bankrupt worked out a deal with uh, the U.S. Treasury and with the big banks in New York. And Singer has attacked uh, the U.S. Treasury. He's attacked the Federal Reserve. He wanted the gold bars from Argentina and the Federal Reserve. And by the way, Romney's his partner on this. Okay, let's remember that. Romney's his partner, his silent partner, small partner. But there's, you know, Romney could make another $100 million by bringing Argentina to its knees. Well, I hope that doesn't happen because I'm from Argentina and I don't want Argentina on its knees. That would be sad, well, Greg. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, you know, the, uh, and that's one of the things that I bring out and that's not in the Nation article, but it is in the book Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, is that this election is more about Argentina than about Detroit. That's, that's a scary big, thought. That's the big fight in international finance today. It is a group of billionaire vulture funds and hedge funds led by Paul Singer and his minor small partner, Mitt Romney, um, and um, versus J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Bank of America, United Bank of Switzerland, who are behind Obama. And they're behind Obama because Singer is attacking Argentina and them because they've, they've been collecting money from Argentina. You know, everyone talks about the Argentine bailout, but in fact, these banks have made back their money and then some. Right. The deal with the Argentine government. And now Singer's saying, no, 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 no. It's all mine. It's all mine. And I'll give some to Mittens here. Well, yet more reasons we absolutely cannot allow for Mitt Romney to be the next president. We've been speaking with Greg Palace, the book which I have here, Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, How to Steal an Election in Nine Easy Steps. Great comics in it by our friend Ted Rawl as well. Congratulations on the book and great work as always, Greg. Pleasure speaking with you. Glad to be with you. It's on the Times bestseller list. I do want to say one thing. I'm not against Romney being president as long as he wins by getting the votes, not by burgling the votes. <laughs> there you go. And we're covering that story as well. Okay, thanks, Greg. Well, we'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Bye. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.
The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Please consider becoming a David Pakman Show member. We rely mostly on individual memberships to fund and grow the show. So please go to davidpakman.com slash membership. Sign up today. A ton of great benefits associated too. The bonus show, the archive of shows, the commercial free TV show, audio and video of the bonus show. It's just incredible, Lewis. It's amazing. It really is. You can't beat it. Nope. Can't beat it. Not at all. Can't beat it. Can't beat it. Thank you. I started getting sent by a lot of audience members this story about Sharmika Moffat, who was allegedly set on fire by three men and that it had KKK written on her car. Here's a local news story about this to give you a sense of what we're dealing with here. Police confirmed to KNOE that a woman was set on fire on a walking trail Sunday evening. She's now at LSU Shreveport recovering, and Jillian Corder has been investigating this story since it first broke, and she's got more from Winsboro. Jillian? That's right, April. Um, Franklin Parish Sheriff's Department responded to a 911 call Saturday night around 8 p.m. at Civitan Park, which is in South Winsboro. 20-year-old Sharmika Moffitt made the call and said that she had been attacked and set on fire by... Th All right. Now, the story, when I started getting the article, sounded a little bit weird to me, but it also sounded incredibly offensive if it was actually true. It turns out, though, that my instincts were not completely wrong because forensic evidence now, according to police, does not support the statement that she was attacked by anybody. In fact, Moffitt's fingerprints were found on a lighter and lighter fluid uh, that were recovered from the scene Investigators believe she set herself on fire and that she used toothpaste to draw KKK and uh, a racial slur on her vehicle. DNA evidence is also pointing to her. This is an incredibly disturbed individual, wouldn't you say? Yes. What was the, the motive here? What is the motive? That's the thing. What is the motive of not even accusing anyone, any one individual, setting yourself on fire? making it seem as if some racist strangers did it to you. I mean, Natan, does this sound like a play for attention? Does it sound like it's just somebody who's mentally ill? Is there no an internal logic to this? I, I, this is very, very odd. Yeah, I, I have no idea. Um, it seems like, uh, well, it seems pretty hard to believe that this person would go through all of this just to act as if she was attacked in a hate crime, right? It, it's so a it lot a of ruling trouble. that out. It's a lot of trouble. And the other thing is, if the idea is, you know, we could, th why do people do things broadly? It's either for revenge on a specific person. Doesn't really sound like that's the case. Although, who knows? Maybe burning herself was somehow, we don't know her personal life, getting back at someone. Or to achieve some kind of financial thing. But again, if there's really not an actual person who did this, who are you going to sue in the end? I, I don't know. I just, I'm trying to make up what might have happened here, and I can't come up with anything. Very, very strange story. I guess we'll just have to keep our eye on it. Is that right? Sure. I would be curious if we ever find out what the motive was and get to the bottom of this hijinks. Yeah, unlikely that we'll find out, but uh, I'm curious. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about bullying, and we talked about a couple of different things. We talked about a boy who was actually bullied on camera during the setup of an interview about being bullied. And I got an anonymous... Hey, well, let's back up. In that conversation, Lewis made a comment saying maybe, you know, not that it's right to bully, but maybe he should have had a different haircut that may not have been as attractive to bullies. Now, not unpredictably, that received a lot of response from the audience. But before we get to that, I actually got an email, which it was not sent anonymously. It was sent by a regular audience member of the show, Lewis, but I'm going to keep the person's name out of it because I just, uh, you know, I'm not comfortable putting their name on. Okay. Um, and he wrote, I will say that it's a male, from around fourth grade to around ninth grade, I was being bullied by a lot of people at my school, verbal and sometimes sexual. I'm a little overweight, but so were a lot of them, so I don't know why they picked on me for, for being overweight. Near the end of seventh grade, I finally snapped. I started chasing one of them down the hall, got right in front of the principal's office, and I just stopped myself. I was never going to do anything to him, really, but it really scared him. It slowly got less and less from eighth to ninth grade and then stopped. Lewis said, you've got to beat up bullies, and it's really hard to pick a side on that. I mean, beating them up isn't a nice solution, but it could work in some situations. I thought I would just share a story and my thoughts. Well, thanks for sharing that story. And it is when Lewis said, you've got to beat up bullies, even if you, it is hard to take a side on that, right? But the point is, a lot of the people being bullied are being bullied because they're not going to beat up the bully. That's the reality of the situation. So I, I worry that saying you've just got to beat up the bully will make those who aren't in a position to do that feel even more helpless. Well, I, 
in certain situations, it definitely works. Uh, I'll leave it at that. But with regard to the hair thing, yeah. basically what I was saying is that... Before you get to okay. that part, okay. let me read that from okay. that email. So then I got another email saying, why would Lewis say that the bullied kid should change his hair so as not to invite bullying? Was that not Mitt Romney's point of view? Are you saying we should not be who we want to be or to look our own way because somebody may not like us for that? Or they may like it and not know how to even express their admiration because the Bible or politics turns it into hate. This is why a bully may cut or tell you what you should wear or cut your hair or tell you how you should wear it. Lewis, I like you, but don't be a bully. How would you respond? I was saying that there are things you can do to lower your risk of being bullied. Would I bully this kid? No. But his hair was ridiculous. And I'd probably make a Justin Bieber comment here and there. In if it general, were an adult, if, you'd be making a Justin Bieber comment. Sure. If you're not willing, I mean, if you're not willing to, to go after the bullies in other ways, if you're too afraid, you're too timid, you don't think it'll work, any whatever reason it may be. Do something to make yourself less there of a target. There are things you can do to lower your risk of getting bullied. The thing I, I worry about pragmatically, Lewis is, is right, okay? The problem is, if that becomes the message, then the message is really understood to the kids who are being bullied as you're being bullied because of who you are. Change who you are to make yourself less of a target. And fundamentally, it's the wrong message to send. Although I'm telling you, Lewis, pragmatically, I know what you're saying. Right, right. I, I'm not saying that should be the message. In general, in your situation, it might work for you in certain situations. Let's go to some of your voicemails. Our voicemail line is available 24 hours a day. Any time of day, you call 219-2DAVID-P, leave us voicemail. Here's a voicemail about my hair during the late night update after the third debate Monday night. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, John Blaskiewicz, and I am a like, member. And I was wondering, um, when you do these, um, um, these like, videos like, that you post like right after the uh, debate on YouTube, like, I was like wondering, like, because your hair is even more crazy in these videos than it, than it is, like, normally. Right. I was, like, wondering, you know, like, what you do, if you didn't mind um, saying, like, 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 um, it's like you're, like, bedhead. But the problem is, I'm on, right now, I'm on a nighttime shower schedule. And as such, it can take several hours after I shower for my hair to get back down to what some might consider a more reasonable level. So when that video was recorded, and you can find it on YouTube, it was just, it, it wasn't the best moment for it, you know? Is there ever a good moment when it comes to your hair? Sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. It happens, it, it's almost, it's about as common as a blue moon, which is, you know, that second full Literally, moon of the month. like blue, like on the screen behind you, blue? No, blue moon is in the second full moon of the month. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, and then here is another voicemail from the Eggman about the anti-Semitic bar mitzvah comment, which we got via voicemail a couple of days earlier. Hey guys, how's it going? I know you're doing your show live right now, and I'm leaving you a message. And it's really dumb, but I'm driving home, and you guys are on live, and, you know, I can't afford that fancy-ass uh, insider deal. I'm just kidding, but I wanted to tell you guys, I feel really bad that neither or any of you have been bar mitzvahed before. So I think we need to have a bar mitzvah for you, David, uh, for Luis also, who sounded kind of bummed out. And I assume Guatam didn't have one, since David didn't have one. Um, you guys need to get $18 checks from your friend's parents. You need to get some crappy gift certificates, and you need to get a savings bond for $36. Yep. Double high, brother. That's what the savings bond was for when I was 13 years old. <laughs> so those all matured for like 40 bucks a pop about, you know, uh, 15 years later. You guys are missing out a lot of studying Hebrew for $36 checks and $18 cash, and no girls will kiss you anyway. So... Sorry you guys missed your bar mitzvah, man. I feel bad. Shalom, what I'm about to Louise. Later. <laughs> okay, so, you know, to cut it short, I did not have the bar mitzvah. I did study the Hebrew, though, because I did go to Hebrew school a couple years. So it seems like I got all of the studying, but none of the $18 checks. Sad. Anyway, we'll see you tomorrow afternoon or on the bonus show if you remember. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.